It seems like um, I watched a little bit of uh, the beginning of a previous song of talk, and it was this is a similar thing with Scott talking about procrastination and how there are two types. Like we can either, uh, well, I think it's helpful to look at it from this perspective that there's the there's the the verbal sankara of the rites, rules, and rituals that we have and we learn from society. And then there's the wise doing of things that we would like to do um, and we think would be wise to do. Um, so there are those two sort of things. The wise doesn't have to always be something we'd like to do, but uh, rites, rules, and rituals, you should do this thing. And there is also... Uh, things that we know are wise and we do them for the sake that they're wise, not to uh, get some far out outcome that we are told we should get. And then there's our relationship to both of those, right? That the relationship to the, um, the Sila, you should do this one thing. Um, uh, this would be also the, um, the third fetter of uh, sila bata paramasa, clinging to rights, rules, and rituals, uh, not understanding why we fall the rights, rules, and rituals, um, that uh, rules or sila um, or precepts do have their benefit, um, but uh, they're often misunderstood in the ordinary mind to having some other benefit of um, some better rebirth, uh, some uh, whatever it may be, that making merit has some benefit in the future where the benefit is not immediate here and now. That, uh, for example, mindfulness of eating practices, that um, there will be some enlightenment or magical thing that will happen or that you're a good boy for practicing mindfulness of eating where the real benefits of mindfulness of eating are found here and now when we see, say, craving arise or tanha or wanting arise for food. And we can uh, relax into that and glide the mind into that. Um, so sila and rites, rules, and rituals, they can have their benefit when they're just seen as such. Um, and these two categories of wise things and sila, they don't really, uh, um, they're not really mutually exclusive. That there's the <clears throat> rules that we cling to, the things that we cling to, they're the things that are wise to do on the other side. And then in between that, there are things that other people think we should do, and uh, maybe we do them because we uh, think it's worthwhile or easier to, to do what they want us to do uh, out of compassion for them, not to upset them. Um, and so it's there's these ways of that we have duties in the world. Um, and originally, when before coming to the Dhamma, the ordinary person relates to these duties in a way of clinging, a way of wanting, a way of I, me, and mine. And now we can begin to relate to these duties in a more skillful way once we can see uh, beyond the aversion to doing things or the liking or disliking. We can realize the impacts that our uh, actions um, or the way we spend our time has in the world. Go ahead. Um, okay. Yeah. A lot to unpack there, but um, something that just sprung to mind um, about duty is that, well, really, now, now that you're on the path, everyone here is on the path, everyone here has discovered um, the Dhamma, discovered the teachings of the Buddha, your only duty is to the Dhamma, and there is no other duty. So, and what does that mean is it's not some sort of like, moral ethical like set of rules that you need to adhere to um no it just means your only duty is to the uh liberation from suffering or essentially happiness so <laughs> the number one goal you you should dedicate as much time as you possibly can in your life to simply just being happy and oh there's nothing to do and nowhere to go and just and because how long are you really here for? <laughs> you're not very, you're not going to be alive for very long. So the number one duty of being alive is to enjoy it. That's the number one duty. And that's, to me, synonymous with the Dhamma. So the Dhamma is um, the, the 
the breath of life, the, the enjoyment of being alive, like the experience of, of really being awake. Like that's why they call it awakening. Cause it really is like you have woken up. There is a brightness. There's a clarity to like seeing, um, seeing like the real, the real immediacy and, and, uh, and potency of your sensory experience and just like the mystery of it all as it unfolds moment by moment. So any society, any societal duty that you had is kind of just like a conditioning to be let go of. Really the only duty there is, is to the Dhamma itself, which is life, enjoyment. Yes, and there be uh, there to be let go of mentally, let go of in the terms of clinging to the duty as I mere mine, that uh, I am a dishwasher for a living. I am a, whatever the job may be for a living. Um, understanding it in a uh, more wholesome sense of uh, maybe the broader picture or uh, understanding that it is wise to acquire uh, food, shelter, adequate housing, and medical care. And there are actions that we take to do that, uh, but not clinging to those actions as I, me, or mine, that they're just those actions, just the intentions. And to understand that the those actions, um, or another way to call them as rites and rituals, is that... <laughs> they're not going to lead to Nibbana. So they are in the path to Nibbana. So nothing we do as a rite or a ritual or like um, sort of sort of like a formality of things, like nothing we do on that basis of just repetition is going to lead to Nibbana. But uh, Actually, just the uh, the repetitive waking up out of that process is what leads to nirvana. So, not not to confuse the repetitive nature of practice, practicing the Dhamma with the repetitive nature of um, you know societal organization and societal functions. So frameworks that our life is given to sort of like the same way like at a cattle ranch they'll have um the little paths for the cattle to walk through they're fenced in and they have to walk through all those are like the societal rites and rituals so what you're actually doing is breaking free from those and then go frolic in the meadow <laughs> so you're going to frolic and be a happy little cow in the meadow you're no longer um, bound by the rites and rituals and the fences and the enclosures um, of these uh, psychological um, prisons mm -hmm. that um, you either had unknowingly or knowingly that you have inherited from uh, the culture and your parents. So it's kind of is like a breaking out of prison type of thing. So it should feel very free and very like open, like, like uh, not to say we don't have our responsibilities and obviously our relative duties to, you know, to seek the end of suffering, right? So um, li living under a bridge and living in in destitution and and. Uh, not not seeking to improve that situation won't um, help our goal for dukkha dukkha naroda. So it's on a completely practical level of why why do we do the things that we do in life? 
It's only for the sake of Duca du Duca Neroda. I know what you're trying to say, but yeah. some people like living on a bridge, so. Oh, yes, yes, yes. If if you can um, live under a bridge and, um, you know, stay relatively away from the exposure of uh, of the elements and, and disease and um, more power to you. Um, <laughs> so, you know, there's no, again, like, there's no formula of the way to do this. But I, I'm saying um, the reason why we might do things is for the sake of Duca Duca Naroda. It's not for the um, ident identification of it. It's not for the, oh, I, this is my job. I'm a big shot. I'm, I'm important. Like, I'm <laughs> no, it's just for the sake of this is the most practical way to end suffering and for myself and others. And, uh, and, and I, I guess like we can talk about it in that kind of way of ending suffering, but that's even kind of like, uh, that's a little like downer. Like that's a little, like you want to think about it on the side of, no, actually just, we get to enjoy this life. We get to enjoy it. Like, like that's a gift, like in and of itself. It's not that we have to, <laughs> um, fight a big, bad boogeyman called suffering which is a mistranslation really what it means is dis-ease dissatisfaction so that's a much more handle like that it brings it down to uh the real scale of it whereas what what we're really just solving here is a simple little dissatisfaction that's it we're just a little bit dissatisfied we can't sit down and just ah, take a deep breath and just relax. That's the only thing we're solving with the Dhamma. We're not tackling these big, um, <laughs> scary boogeyman called suffering and stuff like that, or dark nights of the soul or whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, so if, that's the end of my spiel. If anyone wants to jump in or has anything. Thank you for that. Thank you. I really enjoyed listening. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I've, I've been dealing with some folks on that. I can't we really can't hear you. The connection. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's yes. fine. All right. So recently I've been struggling with some, like, um, social anxiety and that sort of thing. Yeah. And um, like today, I've really like realized that um, it really is just in my mind. Like the situation can be the same because like I was on a train for six hours and this guy didn't message me back. And then not six hours, like three hours. I was like, just like on, on train. Okay. <laughs> Okay, you're on a train. I, I think you broke up. I think you. It sounds like a math problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like the beginning of an algebra problem. You're on train number so, three what? going 30 kilometers an hour, 20 <laughs> degrees to the northeast. When and then, the, like, when he did mess with me at the end of it. And he was like, sorry, sorry, sorry. And I was like, kind of fuming a little bit before he. Oh, is it my connection? Is it really shit? Yeah, man. Yeah. We can't get a sense right. of what you're trying to Someone else speak. Someone else speak. I can it hear sounds you like that you were on the train for six hours and. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, so you're see. heading northeast at about 3.30. <laughs> it's a bullet 30 train. 260 hour. kilometers I mean, an hour. I mean, to be honest, it's like, a, it's, like a, it's like a stupid, like, stereotypical drama story of, like, you know, I was upset and then they said sorry and I felt better. And the situation's the same. Well, it's but good that you shared. Said, I think that um, I thing. think that the people the listening thing. to this uh, will uh, will benefit from hearing, even though that these stories um, are the same. We're all humans. Uh, so if if anyone has stories like this stuff they're going through, uh, I think it's helpful for <laughs> the people watching and you to express it and get answers. No, I usually Thanks, love uh, Robert's. Um, um, 
Ro like what Robert says because it, it generates such good Dhamma talks. So it's always a, a joy to hear oh, Robert share with the Sangha. But it's just the only problem. I'm is, The only problem was this time is the connection. So we couldn't really hear clearly what you're trying to say. So I'm a mobile data underground, like a shopping center. So is, is this mean, the I'm, general I'm, I'm census, or is this the general idea of the story that you are on the train, you texted someone, you expected a text back, and you didn't yeah. hear the text back, and then you got yourself worked up and angry at the person in your head, and then once you got, <laughs> eventually you got a text back and you were relieved. But it's the, like the you've reality heard the story of the situation before, Parker. is that it's you like... were on the train and um, just. Uh, you were, it was just you on a train with your phone, uh, but the mind will create these uh, uh, mental states and get you worked up into a situation of fear of what do they think of me, that there are these concepts that we're clinging to of our social status and what people think of us and how people respect that social status. Uh, and we don't need to get in the nitty gritty of it. All we need to see is that uh, if there can be sati, and the right view and right effort implemented there, we don't have to go down that spot, thought spiral that whenever we wake up to it uh, on that train, at whatever moment that thought comes, we can let go and relax however far we are down the spiral. Oh, I don't need to think about that right now. I'm complete right now. But I don't need this. I don't need this other person's permission to be happy. And the conclusion of the story is he had an underground burger and burger. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> with a Guinness too. <laughs> I got two Guinnesses. I got one for each of us, but I guess now I have to drink both. So. That's a win-win. That's a win-win. <laughs> Are you at like an airport right now, Robert? <laughs> no, I'm just in like a shopping center outside oh. the train station. He's in a sewer. And he's stacking burgers. Tours <laughs> <laughs> like in the UK. We got the posh tours. Stacking burgers at this. But yes, yeah, calm. I'm chilling, Parker. That's you hit the nail on the head. That's literally all I was going to say, and you explained it better for me anyway. So that was it. That was it. Well, you seem satisfied now. Yeah, uh, yeah. I feel good. Good. on that. Good. I'm good. <laughs> like, good. Like, good. Yeah. It helped me deal with like my fear of like social rejection and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's what and I was that, being like. That fear will come stuff. back again, likely. Um, but the uh, the but see the whole process. You'll you'll want to uh, continue to practice and continue to have this repetition and um, reflect on times like now where you are satisfied and you are in a wholesome state uh, that. Um, a simple thought like that or a simple change in the world can set off these conditions in the mind or habit of getting ourselves into an unwholesome state. Uh, so being able to be ready for that and uh, get yourself in a wholesome state when those thoughts arise and see them just as thoughts as not me. That that person, uh, that Instagram account is not me. That's just an Instagram account where messages are shared that arise in my head. That that response from them is uh, not dangerous. There's no me that it's threatening. That response, it's uh, it's just a communication of information. It's what we do with the information that's communicated in the text. If we um, uh, read that information, we process it as uh, this information applies to something I cling to, this idea of myself that I cling to, uh, and. It is then when we feel threatened, then when we feel fear or stress or dissatisfaction arise. But if we can uh, have sati then, have wisdom then, we can just see the text, we can just see the response and leave it just as that. That, okay, they, uh, that, um, they won't be able to make this meeting at some time or uh, there was not a response to the text yet. Okay, there's no me there. There's no clinging to anything there and we can just leave it as that. Well said. Life is beautiful. Yeah, so guys. Don't, it really is. <laughs> really is all about your mindset. It's all, it's all about how you view it. You know. Yes. And I'm realizing this more and more that you know, 
the percentage of like how much of it is how I view it versus how much of it is in a situation is changing. And it really feels like it's becoming more just how I view it. It's how you, it. it's almost a hundred percent how you view it. It's it's like 90% how you view it. It's 10% of what actually happened. <clears throat> and uh, even, I don't know if we want to go to the, that's even more on a mundane even on the mundane level of things, it's 90, 10%, but on the super mundane level of things, it's a hundred percent how you view it because everything is depend dependently originated. So you can actually see, um, in real time, the arising of the feeling mechanism, um, and the sense of self with um, the objects it perceives. Um, and I know I'm trying to use a lot of high fluting words here as a uh, <laughs> Damarado would say, but really um, the actual, what I'm saying is like, there's a skill to be developed that you can see the mechanic the feeling mechanism and you can deconstruct it and you can engineer it to feel the way that you want to feel so it's like an intentional thing but it's a skill that you can develop so like yeah we are changing the way we view things because that's engineering the 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 mechanism for how we feel about things so <laughs> and that's like that's the most important thing like <laughs> like you don't remember you don't remember what someone said to you you don't remember what what exactly you did you just remember how mm -hmm. they made you feel yeah so yeah. in any situation the feelings that's where the um that's where the meat of the sandwich is <laughs> okay mm -hmm. like this is mm -hmm. where the beef is like and it's, it's like the that thinking that uh, just left he the just world left the changing in some way uh changes the way we feel that that person texted me so i feel bad without filling in the steps of the process that that person texted me i didn't like it because i was clinging to some idea of me or mine or whatever and then i felt bad and that process in the middle the the uh, the uh, wanting and liking and clinging that can all be seen and changed if we have the sati and we take the right effort when we see that uh, those thoughts or those processes arise. This is also um, sort of related to uh, um, there was a talk with Robert recorded uh, maybe yesterday, maybe a few days ago about the uh, eight worldly conditions, the eight worldly wins that are talked about in the suttas, uh, mm -hmm. gain and loss, fame and disgrace, praise and blame, and pleasure and pain. And these are all things that are changing around <laughs> us. That these conditions are impermanent. Uh, it's how we relate to these conditions that uh, will uh, decide if we... Uh, suffer or not if there's dissatisfaction or not if there's dukkha or not that go ahead yeah there that these eight uh, worldly winds are all impersonal forces so if you're going to take it, it, it if you see them as like someone to blame for them either yourself or others then there will be dukkha but that's not the way it is. Um, these eight worldly winds have always been how the world works since time and the dawn of civilization. It has been, oh, what is it, uh, ill repute and, okay, I'm not going to list all of them. Like Parker knows all of them, but. <laughs> I, have, I have a list here. <laughs> He's easier. literally ready for any direction the Praise conversation and blame. is going to go. Mm -hmm. Turn it to a poster, put it on your wall. Yeah, so you know, Why? people people are put in the in the headlines of the news article, and then uh, there were 
a couple of weeks before they were some sort of um, hero to the public, and then now they're um, <laughs> now they're the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> so these are the eight worldly winds, and they just blow around like impersonal, just like the weather. They're winds, right? So you're not gonna get mad at a hurricane for being a hurricane. A hurricane just happens. It's just a byproduct of forces that are operating on a much grander scale than anyone is responsible for or can even um, can even like you can't pin a self down to it. There's no there's no um, this whole mixture of things happening. There's no self that like <clears throat> happenings together as like that's um, that person is to blame for that or, or you're or even something you did in the past like that is completely gone and like every moment is just its own birth like the universe perpetually giving birth to a new moment and there's no there's no continuous entity so it's completely free that's what the, that's why uh samsara is nirvana like once you realize this, like the simple truth of it, like the simple Dhamma, then you're out of the the um, the cycle of birth and death. So yeah, that eye of the hurricane. Yeah. So you all the dukkha is going around around you, but there's no need to jump in the hurricane and cling to any of it because right. you'll just get blown away. Right. <clears throat> I get a lot of that um, with uh, my a lot of my students want to talk about the news and how they're stressed out by these events, these world events, these events in their city or in their country, you know, and I, I, I let them speak for a little while. Just listen. And I'm like, well, does worrying about it help the problem out? Does it assist it in any way? And they're like, no. And I said, do you think not worrying about it is going to make it worse? Well, no. Okay. <laughs> think about that. <laughs> think about that for a moment. <clears throat> and it's like, oh, I guess I hadn't considered that before. So. Yeah, it's mo most of our griping and comes out of delusion that that uh, is not beneficial for anyone. Yeah, like a lot of people feel like they have a responsibility to worry or to be informed and attached yeah. to being informed is this idea of worrying with that. Like, oh, if I'm not informed and if I'm not concerned or angry or upset or dissatisfied somehow, then yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> I'm not paying attention or I'm somehow yeah. f failing my duty as a citizen of Yeah, it's complete whatever. bullshit. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it really is, right? But yeah. they've, you know, that's part of their illusion, part of their identity that they're yeah. buying into, you yeah. know, and rather than in saying in an aggressive way, um, <clears throat> I'm trying to skillfully lead them to the conclusion of, that their worry actually only hurts themselves. It doesn't actually assist or alleviate the, whatever the problem is they're concerned about. Right. You know, at all. So. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> this is sort of uh, the same on the same uh, uh, wavelength of the poem that uh, was shared. Uh, I shared earlier in the Discord and Skype by Buddha Dasa that the title is "Insane for Them to Cheer." There's a lot of wanting to look good, but it's much more difficult to do. Right. So they get carried away as if crazy. Aren't we silly, we people creating ourselves? Thinking it's right, it's good, following the advice of ghosts, so they lose the path of morality. Sunk in the mud beneath the lotus's roots, blossoming all over, not all fragrant. Not at all fragrant. This makes them push ahead as if crazy, <clears throat> getting upset, revealing their lunacy even more, showing off their very craziness. Boy, it's very hard to do good. Or boy, it's hard to really do good. That uh, this, this stressful attitude of wishing things would be different, cling to things, wanting them to be different in our minds, 
of seeing some news event, not liking it, getting stressed about it, talking to the friends about it. Isn't this horrible? That has no real impact, no real doing good. And, and, it's, and it's like if you look at your life and you see on the moment-to-moment basis like what has changed in my real <laughs> life, nothing has changed in, on that level of things. And then so all of this is like a big, like that, that poem. That's a, such a good poem, to, um, Parker. Um, um, my interpretation of that is, is uh, it's like, it's like poking fun at like the lunacy of this show that humans engage in of like, of, <laughs> of putting our own virtues on a pedestal as a, like a showmanship thing. So it's like you're not actually living it. You're just saying, oh, these other people need to think I'm a good person. So I'm going to say this or I'm going to act upset about this. It's all like it's all show. It's a game show. <laughs> it's like a virtuous. It's like a virtuous peacock. Yeah, right? it's like it's you're just, just a, it's like a big dazzling illusion it's just another, to get like, praise. For it. Yeah, you're trying yeah. to come. Really, what you're trying to do is put yourself above <laughs> others with mm-hmm. extravagant m- mm-hmm. means of like trying societal manipulation or like trying to fool others into thinking that you're a good person instead of actually just being a good person and like being an earnest person and and living off the fruit of that and the the happiness that comes from simply doing good by yourself and doing good by others like that's what that's the only <laughs> that's the only purpose and like that's the only good that's going to come <clears throat> good intention like it's well, not for it's not for like the reward that or it's not for so you're going to make so a bunch of people are going to think you're a good person no that doesn't matter what matters is the actual direct experience of are you acting from a place of goodwill and are you is there good intentions in your heart? And that's where <laughs> it matters. And all that virtue cueing you're talking about, all that, vir- all that you know, morality cueing that you're discussing actually inflates the sense of self-importance at the same time, too. So it actually b- bolsters the ego. It makes it even, even uh, more unmanageable, you know? Right. So, it's, yeah, yeah it, it just <clears throat> in disaster. Exactly. And... Uh, people become crazy <laughs> you, i'm still like, suffering you, from P- ptsd from listening to the latest jordan peterson uh, video oh yeah like jordan peterson is a good example like the, the 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 thing is it doesn't matter what side of the um political spectrum you are you can see the same truths in every single side of it so you can see the lunacy that goes on in both sides like 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 um this rabbit holes like mental rabbit holes that um you can go on like jordan peterson um thinking it's like some sort of like wise philosophy but like really you you look at him and he's miserable and he's not a happy person so that's the fruit so if you want to see like it does this guy really know what he's talking about like talking about life well, let's see, like, what is, <laughs> what is he like? Like, does he actually um, enjoy himself or is he preaching some sort of, like, sad, like, very nihilistic type of, like, I don't know. Um, <laughs> most of Western philosophy is, like, pretty downer. It's like, like if you read like Schopenhauer and stuff, like you're gonna want to, like all this stuff is like garbage, and it's not, it doesn't lead to anything good. Like, it's a uh, a lot of sati, a lot of seeing, a lot of conceptualizing. There's dukkha. There's a lot of suffering. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. world really sucks. We can really without go any in changing of that dukkha. Yeah, yeah. We can go as intricate as we want to about how much dukkha there is. And we can talk about 
we could write essays and essays about the Duca. No, but they've, that's ar- not they've already to been me. written. They've already been written, Scott. <laughs> they've already been written, but that's not interesting. That's not what people, that's not really what matters. What matters is the way out of Duca or the end of Duca. And that's the only that, uh... inter- so that's the only interesting uh, philosophy, if you want to put it that way, there is. And uh, that's a lot shorter. That's a lot shorter and more simpler way out. Suffering is really complicated and it gets really in depth and like um, um, the way out tends to be a little bit more concise, a little bit more precise. And that's why um, the Dhamma is such a beautiful instrument that is, I, go for it. I've got a, I've got a way to con- like concisely say all that. Let's. Let's not map out the dungeon. Let's just go for the exit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like don't that. Map the, yeah, don't map out the dungeon. Just go for the exit. That's it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Beautiful. <laughs> and don't write about your experiences in the dungeon. Just go for the exit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the dungeon, just go to the exit. Go to the but exit. the the dungeon scholar would go to each room of the dungeon. Okay, this room's that. They'll come to the end, but they won't exit at the end. They'll go back because they missed. Because there's more. There's the more to room. explain. There's more, there's more yeah, treasures. They gotta get to the get. Easter eggs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a completionist. It's a completionist dungeon trip. <laughs> Just go for the exit, man. Just go for the exit. <laughs> it's dark down there. It's cockroaches. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been uh, I've been managing a bit of a mild cold for the last uh, three days. It's been a tad uh, difficult to to sit in formal practice, but um, it's been a great it's been a really great experience because having this symptoms whatever they may be are <clears throat> really making me aware of the physical form and it's actually been something as odd as it sounds kind of pleasurable to have this experience of feeling tired and um you know having difficulty speaking or right. especially when i'm speaking as a teacher i have got to do a lot of talking um and trying to stay focused but rather than trying to feel annoyed by this you know this situation i've been viewing it as just an opportunity like another opportunity to appreciate things the way they are you know in the moment and yeah it's 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 great i mean i'm not you know i'm not experienced severe symptoms so it's relatively easy to do it this time you know yeah. But it's um, yeah, it's it's actually been I'd say uh, an interesting and pleasurable experience. And after the initial bout of oh, I can't do exactly as I want to do. I can't exercise the way I want to. I can't sit in formal practice the way I want to. After that, like little momentary bout of like uh, after that, I was just it was a very time to accept that situation. It's like okay, let's just do, take the steps it, it, that I need to. Um, respect and adjust to what I what I've got the situation is going on and you know <clears throat> every time I have to cough or clear my throat that's an opportunity to wake up <laughs> wake up you know so the fine it's sort of like finding finding this moments of awareness that the cold is providing to me rather than trying to resist it and say <clears throat> the cold is distracting me from X, Y, Z. I'm like, no, the cold is actually showing me what's going on. And that's a good thing. That's a very helpful thing. So I wanted to share that um, experience with everybody. <laughs> yeah, that sounds really skillful. But even even, even uh, mild uh, illness can, can be used to stay, stay in the moment, right? To appreciate it, you know? Um, you know, and that feeling of hot soup when you're sick is really great. You know, it's really great. And just to get lost in that, right? Like 
certain sensations are more uncomfortable, but some sensations are actually more pleasurable mm. they alleviate that symptom. So, you know, I just figured, oh, it's a good opportunity to tell all my Dhamma friends that, you know, it ain't that bad. It's actually, it's actually a great opportunity. You know, and when my students ask me, oh, how are you today? I'm not someone who says, oh, I'm fine. I tell them how I am. I'm like, oh, I'm sick. You know, oh, you're sick. Yeah, what's wrong? Oh, I have this and this and this. Oh, I'm so sorry. But I try and push them away from feeling sympathy for me. Yeah. I say, no, don't feel bad. I'm I'm fine. I'm good. Yeah. I'm, I'm able to do my job and I'm able to talk to you. I'm not in the bed. I'm not in the hospital. You know, this is not too bad. You know, I may not speak as uh, quickly or have as many things to say because my mind is a little bit slower. But let's continue, you know. And just keep it going, you know? So anyway, that's my experience I wanted to share with everybody. <clears throat> I like that, the honesty. Yeah, Thank you for like, sharing. Yeah, like you were saying, though, just being like, hey, I am sick, but I'm yeah. fine with it. Not just I'm fine, but hey, you know, I am sick. I'm having these physical things happen, but I'm adjusting to it. You yeah. would say, though, Rick, it, it sure beats the alternative. Of like taking that approach as opposed to just being like, oh, you know, really going into this is thinking, awful. Yeah. Or like, oh, I've got five more hours of yeah. conversations with people. How yeah. am I going to make it like that? Yeah. No, it's just like, no, I've got five or you know, 20 conversations in the next five hours. And even even not feeling well, let's see if I can still somehow take the person from a state of discomfort or anxiety and bring them to a calmer, more pleasure, ple like more happy or happier state uh -huh. with this 10 or 20 minute conversation, regardless of how I'm physically feeling, because mentally I'm still feeling wonderful. I'm still feeling pleasant. I'm still feeling satisfied. And so that doesn't matter. The, the physical conditions don't affect the internal what all is going on. And okay. it's not enough to, so, you know, yeah, so that's a good example of um, it's not necessarily the circumstances or what that information or what is actually happening, but how you and interpret it. So if 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 we're uh, feeling a little sick, a little under the weather, and we view that through, how are you going, Robert? <laughs> You're on mute. Okay, I hear you. What's up, Robert? Shit. My phone's on four percent, so I'm gonna have to need it for Spotify on the way back. But it's okay. been a great. Right. I've enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. Guys, Good made you, made Robert. my evening a Good lot, seeing a you, lot Robert. better. Yeah, Thank I'll you see you next you. time, Robert. Bye, bye. Bye, Robert. Bye. So Peace. what I was getting to say is, uh, so yeah, if you view you're a little bit under the weather and you view things like, oh, like I have, oh, how many more hours of this do I have to do and then just get through it, and it's going to be a like a fight all the way through it and it's going to you're going to suffer all the way to the very end um but if you view it um um you you view and interpret it differently like you can see it as an opportunity to remember an opportunity to practice the dhamma exactly it's that's so, what i and that's what i look at it yeah. as. it's all just an opportunity you know, and the, and the students, you know, they, they want to give me all kind of sympathy. I'm like, no, look, I've got my coffee. <laughs> I've got my water. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not in this, I'm not on my deathbed, you know, it's fine. Now let's do this. So, yeah. That objects uh, that we don't like or situations that we don't like, we can even think of teachers like this is a great opportunity to practice being sick i'm grateful for this this is a gift That's precisely similar precisely. experiences with people we don't like or we compete with that i'm very glad i met this person because they showed me a side of me that was competitive or didn't like people or there was some aversion there that can be a great gift for us uh, in practice to expose these um unwholesome uh Tendencies. Yeah, these are habits. Some habits. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Because, hey, we're going to get sick. We're going to die. So if we can have practice with being sick uh, before we get sick and die, that's a great opportunity. 
and realizing, yeah, the body is just a body. Mm. Uh, no one ever promised you that you'd be able to breathe through your nose. <laughs> that uh, the nose gets stuffy and there is breathing through the na- mouth and there is congestion. You and just these are all imperfect. Uh, uh, Not full of seawater in Thailand and just, just snort it up through one nostril. That's what, uh, that's the Domorado solution to stuffy nose. So grab some seawater. It's, and it's kind of, it's up. kind of expensive to get some from Thailand right now. <laughs> I have to jump through a lot of hoops to get Thailand's. Well, I the, see the specific Thailand seawater has like better cleansing properties. <laughs> So a, we could actually start a business like there's this. A thai, there's, there's a Thai there's a Thai restaurant up the road, and I'm gonna ask them if they have any sea I'm just gonna start <laughs> mixing some salt and water together, and I'm gonna put Thailand on it, and I'm gonna start an uh, international business and start shipping it. Out. People would buy. It. People would buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Thai sea water, man. It's good for what else, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I, uh, on that note, I think I'm going to head out now. It's good to see everyone. Good to see you, Scott. Great nice seeing you, nice Scott. You too. Nice, guy. Hi, so, everyone. Well, I guess before I head off, I'm going to ask one quick question for the four of you, if you have time. <laughs> Uh, when you all are practicing uh, meditation, what sorts of insights uh, come along and how often do they come along? I'm letting this question be as open as possible just because I'm trying to see uh, how you all interact with your meditation practice on a daily basis and, w- and when or where, if at all, um, insight states arise. That's, um, I'll, I'll answer for okay, me first. Uh, um when I'm when I'm meditating, um, and if if a thought or an insight arises, I'm I usually just uh, let it pass by or ignore it. I don't actually cling to the insight because I find that that goes back into thinking again. Because my goal is not uh, my goal is not a goal, but my my, <laughs> my sitting practice is about the it's about you know relaxing in the breath and so. I'm I'm more uh, allowing that relaxation to continue to grow and 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 um and spread. So for me, any insights that might arise, uh, I might put a pin in it for later. But I don't want to have that insight or think that insight because it's going to pull me right out of jhana. It's going to pull me right out of my states that I you know been cultivating. So yeah, for me personally, I, I, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't entertain any insights whilst in meditation. No. Fair enough. Yeah. That's my that's my experience anyway. I think uh, maybe my question was a little off then. Um, rather than distinct thoughts about insights. Um, Other than attaining enlightenment and reducing suffering, of course, what are some uh, in the moment benefits, I guess, do you get out of meditating while meditating? Satisfaction. (laughs) Right here and now. Nothing to do and nowhere to go. I don't know. It's satisfaction. It's the, this breath is good enough. It's, it's, once you click in, it's just a sustained clicking. It's, there's... Mm. Uh, it's 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 there's not a lot of grabbing like like meditation prizes it's not a grab it's not a yeah. cat's grab it's none of that it's more of this moment is beautiful and so is this until you no longer even have to name it anymore there's no discursive thought and it that that time you're just literally clicked into a flow the flow of life the flow of breathing the flow of the universe, the flow of the Dhamma, whatever. There's just that in itself seems like such a reward. I can't, I can't really conceive of any other ones. 
Yeah. And if they are there, they make themselves apparent in, in more uh, in, in like the Sati awakening throughout my my daily life. Hmm. Like this thing about feeling sick and, and like enjoying that experience. Right. But once once you've clicked into a flow, then there's I don't know, there's no there's there's nothing else. And there doesn't need to be. To, and yeah. again, my experience, there just doesn't need to be anything else. That's great. That's that's just nice. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's my experience with it. No, that, that more than answers my question. I guess I should say then that um, a lot of my interest in um, Buddhism has been kind of philosophical or technical rather than epistemological and actually uh, based on experience. Bye, Veda. Bye, Veda. Bye. Good seeing you. And that's mainly just because I struggle with meditating. Um, a lot of the time when I meditate, it's almost as if my like rumination and suffering actually increases rather than decreases. And so that's sort of made me uh, think of meditation almost like this big scary monster rather than like a, a friend or the well, best practice that's possible. That's good seeing that. Yes, it, when we look at it, it does increase in the sense that it was in the background per se, or we are doing things to avoid those objects. Um, but it's uh, it's a success to see all that stuff. That it isn't a failure to see all there's all that dukkha. That's a step. That first the um, that uh, much of the uh, um, treatment of a disease is the diagnosis of it. Uh, that if you are unable to uh, diagnose the disease, what will the treatment help? So first seeing the disease of dukkha, yes, there is dukkha, there is dissatisfaction right, right now. And when we can see that clearly, that's the first step of the process, right? If someone has um, cancer and it's diagnosed, say, as uh, uh, what? Uh, allergies and the treatments are given for allergies, uh, that would be of no benefit for the person that... Uh, although the seeing the cancer might be, uh, there might be some fear that arises at first, the person would be much better off seeing the cancer and treating it as that. So seeing that, yes, there is dukkha, there is de dissatisfaction. Woohoo! I saw it. Now I can change it. Now I can see the dukkha and uh, talk myself into a wholesome, no problem state and do that over and over again. Relax and no problems. That the mind does have the tendency, it is in the habit of conditioning itself into a very uh, unwholesome, unsafe state. And the practice is seeing that, diagnosing that, and then treating it. And the treatment is immediate. The treatment is, oh, no problems. Oh, where is the dukkha? Where is the tension in the body? Where are the emotions of the body? Can I play with that? And coming out of that state of dissatisfaction, of uh, fear of something, into a state of security. Or you know, to use my dungeon metaphor, which I really enjoy right now, uh, you gotta. You, in order to know where you are in the dungeon, you have to turn on the light to see to see where you are before you can start <laughs> moving to the exit, right? And when you turn on that light initially, you're gonna see a lot of dukkha. There's a lot of stuff going on right where you are uh, initially, and as you develop the good habit of moving towards satisfaction of tossing out those unwholesome thoughts but until you turn on the light you don't even know how much they're right that where you are exactly where your position is relative to the exit you know <clears throat> i think i see what you're saying honestly uh, i guess my my main interest at this point is just getting into the um what i'd like to call the second step of meditation if there is a list of steps beyond just sitting and actually experiencing what's going on i'd like to hear more i guess about the the treatment aspect of it in your metaphor like what is there to do other than to sit with the dukkha realize that it's temporary uh decline to cling to it and then let it pass on right to um we need to make sure that we're actually really waking up to the fact that it's temporary and we're above it, say, that uh, 
there's the idea that it's temporary and, oh, I'll just suffer through it until it's over. Uh, compared to, not that the Duke is temporary, but the conditions are temporary. That certain things we don't like are temporary. And, mm. oh, I'm sick <laughs> and I'll get over it and I'll just suffer through it. Compared to, oh, it's temporary and I can be above all this stuff, and I can be happy and satisfied. I can be happy right now. I don't have yeah. to wait for something. To, I don't have to wait for the conditions to change for me to be happy because that's the same thing. That's the same trap that people get into with. Um, I'll fi- like when they're not they're not interested in the Dhamma or they're not aware of it, and they're just like, oh, I'll finally be happy when I get this promotion. I'll finally be happy when I get this married or whatever retirement or first million dollars it's the same kind of magical thinking in a way but it's more associated with um having like favorable conditions in their life Mm -hmm. but if you step back like one step back like what we're talking about now okay once these clouds part then everything's cool and i can be happy again (laughs) <laughs> and it's like, no, you can't yeah. wait for don't don't no. wait for the clouds to part. It's that's an external condition that mm-hmm. it doesn't need to affect the internal condition of the satisfaction of the sati. It doesn't it doesn't necessarily need to. And it just takes constant repetitive practice. I mean, it's 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 like a I mean, I know it kind of feels like a grind in the beginning, but it's what it's necessary. Yeah, you know, because but, yeah. think about how habitual your thinking is related to that. I'll, I'll give you a quick story. I was talking with a student just this morning uh, who was telling me, you know, how difficult it was for her to relax, how difficult it was for her to relax. And she said, and I don't know why. And I explained to her her whole life. Everyone's been telling her it's wrong to relax, like her parents said, don't relax, right? Her school said, don't relax. Her society said, don't relax. And now someone's just saying, relax, like it's like it's so easy, like the snap of a finger. And it's not because it's habitual. It's mm-hmm. been ingrained. And it's a relaxing itself is a practice. It's a skill that needs that should be honed and, and worked on. And so, yeah, it can seem like a repetitive grind at times, but it's 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 one of the best ways off the dungeon. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it, it's helpful to remember to enjoy the grind as well. Like in, enjoy the process, like, you know, yeah. um, and, and when one wakes up to those thoughts, like really uh, bringing that congratulations and r- like really like just like congratulations and success. And like, really, I think especially um, towards like, um, you know, the beginning, you know, of even a sit or whatever, but like really just that can be very helpful is just to spend some time with that one hindrance is spotted to like be like, yeah, this is successful just seeing it, you know, disidentifying from it. And that's part of the process of seeing it and just recognize, okay, cool. And, you know? and don't and don't underestimate the hindrance of doubt. Mm. It's 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 both it, it, doubt is one of those things that's it can be both sharp and momentary and like, like very like, oh, this isn't working. Oh. Yeah. And it can also be like an underlying kind of um, like, I don't know, like an, an underlying feeling too of testing and then seeing it's not working and testing and seeing it's not working. And so the doubt is sort of this hindrance. It's like this underneath it's eroding the foundation of what you're trying to do of what you're doing. So Mm. be super vigilant about doubt because it's a big one. That hindrance is a big one. And it really knocks a lot of folks who just find the path right back off again, right back off. Mm. Even after two years or three years, they're still, struggling a lot with doubt because they're testing to see if it's going to work and that testing to see if it's going to work to go, look for that reward okay finally it's you know it's it's like that horse just keeps bucking you and you're like okay wait that's just doubt again coming back up and <laughs> i've handled doubt before i know you doubt let's just sit back down and enjoy this breath <laughs> Doubt is a big one and i know it's it's a lot of a lot of times the questions that you may have that people have is rooted in that in that hindrance and it's not to say don't have questions but often those questions are coming out of wanting to quell that hindrance when 
the best way to quell it is to recognize what it is and toss it out as you do, you know? That's a big one. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. I mean, I don't really have like a, a perfect catch-all response to that other than uh, realizing that this is probably where I've been personally for the past couple of years in regards to my interests with Buddhism. Uh, I've managed to sit here and there but the main thing I really do is just read read the suttas. Just because I feel like when I read them, uh, it gives me a lot of hope and insight into how suffering works. But what I probably should do a little more often would be um, Anapanasati, where I will sit with it and experience how it is personally. But I don't know. Not uh, – and – Taking it easy and having it, oh, I get the time to relax and take a load off. Uh, because the mind will make it into something. It's a job to do. And I'm yeah. not fulfilling my job right now. Oh, what a bad student I am. But we can make yeah. it, to, oh, I just get to chill. That's so nice. I get to chill. <laughs> but then the mind will be like, oh, what about enlightenment? Will I ever get there? <laughs> what about these things I've been reading about in the suttas? Am I ever going to get there? And the answer is, you're already here. Just let go and, mm. and relax. Yeah, be, be careful of those shoulds because it sets up a false expectation. It sets up a lot of internal pressure about what – about like, you know, um, idea, like re reality versus like the ideal versus a perfection state or whatever. And that's also not reality. That's not in the present moment. So be aware of the should. And yeah, I think it's helpful to try and reframe it. As you said, Parker, oh, finally, now is a great opportunity to enjoy the breath for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Not, right. oh my God, it's 6 p.m. and I haven't meditated at all today. It's just like, oh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not doing it right. <laughs> I'll never do it right. I'm and never going to get enlightened at this rate. Here comes doubt again. Doubt comes right back in. Shoulds, shoulds and, and expectations set doubt up. Doubt like becomes really, really strong and it pierces through things. Instead of going, oh, wow, look at that. Um, I could I could watch, uh, you know, 20 minutes of, uh, of, of a show or I could just sit down for 10 and enjoy the breath. Oh, it's a great opportunity to do that. Why not? Sure, why not? Instead of anything else. Yeah. And Caleb, I think this deserves great congratulations. Uh, the fact that you can realize that um, that this uh, wanting to learn or fear of <clears throat> meditation uh, maybe kept you away from it. That that is not something to feel guilty about. That yeah. is something to rejoice in the fact that you're able to see that. That we often have the idea that... Um, uh, oh, what a bad person I was for making that mistake for so long and not fixing it. But there's the quote. Uh, you can hear the quote, but then you can actually realize it. I don't remember who it's from or what. But the, the best time to plant a tree was 100 years ago or something like that. And the second best time is now. That this moment, you're smiling, so I see that you get it a little bit. This moment is all that we uh, this have. So a lot of the mind right here, right now. And that's that's the practice. It's immediate. Yeah, I mean, our locus of control is ever so infinitely bound to the present. So considering trying to change the past or plan for the future is almost fruitless. But, but we do it anyway. We do right, it we anyway, do, right? We, we do it. We do it anyway. And one of the and one of the great temptations is to, especially with our Western sort of intellectual scientific proclivity is to tr like try and map everything out first. And so, oh, I know that this is the best thing for me to do because I figured it all out. But I hate to say it like this, but that's procrastination in a lot of ways. That's procrastination. That's waiting for conditions to be right again or waiting to, oh, I just need to figure this one more thing out. And then the equation makes sense and then I can sit down and practice perfectly. It's like, there is no such thing. <laughs> There's no such thing as perfect practice. There's no such thing as perfect anything. Right. Not like that. Not like that. Yeah. It's going to be in the moment is already perfect mm -hmm. without any judgments on it, without any categories or labels. And the more you recognize it through the enjoyment of the breath, the more you realize that there's no need for expectations. Right. He's already perfect. It's already sweet. It's already amazing.
it's already wonderful. Like that's it. That's what we got. Yeah. I mean, as long as I can remember. Philosophical. I mean, philosophy and stuff is really fun. It's like it's like chewing bubble gum with your brain. It's fun. It's juicy, but it's not really sustaining, right? It doesn't fill you up. It will not satisfy you. Philosophy will not satisfy you. It's just it's a fun game. Yep. It's a fun the thought. Flavor of the bubble gum runs out. You'll need another stick. Exactly right. Exactly right. You know, and and then you've been chewing bubble gum for a week and you're starving. Precisely, precisely. And then someone comes along and they offer you a new flavor and say, they say, this will sustain you. Try existentialism. Try this version of existentialism, right? Try this version of, you know, whatever. And you go, oh, okay, I'll try this. This is the one that'll fill me up. This is the one I'm it's sure. It's the practice of. that was the problem. It was not a panasati. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Meta. Yeah, yeah. And then you start chewing again. You're like, wait a second. This is just, this tastes like the other flavors. <laughs> yeah. It's not sustainable. It doesn't, it doesn't fill you up. It doesn't bring you joy and satisfaction long lasting. You know, it's fun. It's fun. Like a movie, it's fun. It's a momentary distraction while you, you know, move through the, that experience. But then, then it's done. And you're still like, oh man, I don't feel satisfied. Yeah. So you're telling me that all of the suttas are just a long-winded advertisement for sitting meditation? In a way, I think that the suttas are a way of helping people, um, you know, like, in a, like practically see that, like help them with sati, not necessarily in, in formal practice, but help them see in different situations about that, right? I'm right. It's 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 a way of giving them a kind of like a cheat sheet into oh okay I've seen that other people have seen this exact same situation and here's their advice rel relative to that that's what I think the sutras can be about yes 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 but not necessarily an advertising for meditation but meditation is strongly recommended <laughs> mm, yeah actual practice is strongly recommended because then. You won't just have to believe it on faith of, oh, it's going to work. You're, you've experienced mm -hmm. it. You know it does. There's no such thing as – it's like no one needs to have faith in gravity, do they? You know it's, a, you know it's, a, it's just a straight-up fact. It's a brute fact of the world, right? It's a straight-up brute fact. It is there, whatever it is, right? I mean, come on. <laughs> no one's arguing that. No one's arguing against it either. There's no theorizing about it. It's just the, what it is. So it's the same thing with the Dhamma. Once you get to a certain point, there's no debating about it anymore. There's no need for that anymore. It's just a brute fact. It's an experiential thing, though, not an intellectual thing. Not, a, oh, it makes sense to me. Oh, I can see how that's true. No, no, it. you feel it. <laughs> you just feel it. You move through the yeah. world with it. Yeah, you're not separated anymore. You're not... It's not an objective reality, like, oh, okay, yeah, that's true. No, I mean, you're like, oh, man, I am it, <laughs> and it is me. <laughs> like that, like that, yeah. Anyway, mm. I hope that made sense. It did. Okay. I think I needed to just have a little bit more of a grounded uh, perspective for how this kind of stuff works. I always thought that uh, if I had read just a little more, I'd find one key little tidbit that would help explain that. That'll tip sit. it. That'll tip mm -hmm. it. That'll, 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 now the conditions will finally be right for me to feel comfortable to practice. Now, finally. But that basket never gets full, does it? It never quite gets full because, because it's, you're just chewing gum with your brain. Yeah. You're just chewing gum. Yeah. It's all right. I've been there too. I remember. <laughs> I remember. I went to. I went, my first. My first foray into into university was philosophy. I was sure I was going to figure it out that way. I was and, a physicist for two years in school, but then I, I decided against that. And then I took one sociology course. It was about um, social interactionism, and it showed me the link, the the symbolic nature of language. And as soon as I took that sociology course, I, I changed my major from, from philosophy to religious studies. <laughs> <laughs> that one course changed my path. And that's when I discovered the Eastern, Eastern, uh, Eastern stuff. 
Yep. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, so we all go through this. We all go through this uh, doubt or phase where we're looking for the right practice. Yeah. Um, but the key is to see that that itself, uh, that doubt, uh, wanting to know, not knowing enough, uh, that's a sense of dissatisfaction, that you need yeah. to know more, that there's enough. So we can have guidelines to help us, and those can be beneficial, but uh, needing guidelines uh, is unwholesome, and we actually have to be investigating these guidelines themselves. We have to be using them on our own mind and seeing how does this work? Has uh, no problems. And when we can practice it and see whether it works or not, uh, it's scientific in that way, that um, that science is practical, that there are tests done, there are experiments done. So uh, in, instead of uh, looking at the textbook and preparing for the test and preparing for the test and never actually doing the experiment, we need to uh, experiment. And that's... Uh, that's the that is the practice is looking at reading the book between your two years study that one really well hey joe it's good to see you joe okay i've actually uh gotta go i'm gonna go sit for 15 minutes Woohoo! great sounds great <laughs> good Better enjoy y'all. that enjoy well, that'd be a time to just relax right <laughs> y'all good, good to day. see you caleb but yeah. How are you guys all doing? Oh, great. Yeah. I'm uh I'm I'm dealing with a cold right now, but I'm enjoying that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm using that as an opportunity to practice and be aware of the body. So, I'm I'm cool with it. Yeah. Cold in the summertime, that's a little odd. Yeah, well, there was a fair amount of, um, uh, you know, moving through crowds and and things like that this this uh, like last weekend uh, because of the holiday. So I'm sure that one of the many people that we probably came in contact with uh, had something, and so it just got passed along. But eh, that's okay. I'm 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 uh, I'm I'm enjoying it. I'm I'm using it as an opportunity to to be aware of things. <laughs> <laughs> so how about you joe how are you yeah i'm good i uh i had to do some paperwork today it feels like my paperwork never ends related to my farm uh <laughs> and it was, it was a little strange bit, it was a little bit confusing and uh i i, I just i kind of like sent an email at, at the end and i was just like you know if I just didn't do this, what would happen? Because like I just I just sort of had, <laughs> had this thought like because they were like you, you need to fill out this paperwork and I just I didn't really understand why and I and it was such a long thing it was so many pages that I was like if I just didn't do it what what would happen and I'm curious to see the response to that. <laughs> did you did you straight up ask them that or are you just gonna yeah just yeah not, yeah oh. because i've been going back and forth for like uh like four months with this person uh like and they just keep sending me paper it, you know it's just how things tend to work when uh-huh. you're dealing with bureaucrats you know you like didn't fill out a form and you did fill out a form so what what happened was that i needed to get permission to do something and then i didn't do it at exactly the right time so then i had to cancel it and then reapply for permission and I just emailed them and was like, what if I just didn't do that? What if, what if I just don't cancel it and don't reapply? And then when I actually do this thing that I applied for in the first place, like like that time frame just comes, because it'll, ta- it'll take them like a month to respond. And by that time, I'll already have done it. And so I, I don't know, it, I, it just, it's kind of fun <laughs> playing with them because like their mind is so used to like, they're the boss, but they actually don't really have that much power because like, what like what can they really do? I mean, they they can't. They don't, this person doesn't have the power to find me. They don't have the power to tell me I, I I'm not allowed to do this. So, just kind of messing with them a, a little bit. But <laughs> yeah, so I'm I'm I'm, just a little, I'm a little bit tired of tired of paperwork is is all. But that's that, that's okay. You know, it's a world. It's a world that we live in a little bit. Is that it's the dusty world, right? It's the dusty world. Yeah. And, and they and you know these kinds of forms ju- definitely justify their jobs too, right? If they didn't have forms, they wouldn't have jobs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh my goodness. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We find we find a way to make life really really complicated, you know, and uh, it doesn't it doesn't really have to be, but it it tends to be. It, I mean, I I just I don't like I don't feel like like I don't feel this sense of authority anymore where I'm scared that something's gonna happen uh, in the same way. So like my reaction is is kind of like that where I'm like, well, if I just didn't do this what what would happen you know and because I, I i don't actually know what they're going to respond because the, the it's it's hard to explain it's like a huge thing but basically i have a feeling that i'm kind of right that I, my original application will just be fine and if i just like wait if i if i stretch out this conversation long enough my original application <laughs> I like, will I like still that. be you're valid just, you're just gonna I'll wait skip, it out yeah and i'll skip like 20 pages of like saying my name again and my address again and my two copies of my passport and my name change document and all all this other right because they are they already have the information they need they, yeah that's the thing they already have it so right. i know what you mean like it seems very empty right. like a very futile <laughs> thing to just give them information on the box they want it's right. like oh you guys could i'm sure you could do that you do it yeah. all day you could do that can't so, you so when so when they respond in like another couple weeks, uh, I, my next response is going to be, can I just change the date on the original forms that I sent in? Because it's going to be the exact same form after I cancel the first one. And then I'm hoping by that time, yeah, the timing will line. I don't know. I, I, I don't really care how, how it turns out, but it's, it's, just... it's insane how much paperwork farmers have to go through. Like you wouldn't believe it. They make it extremely difficult to do anything on your land uh it, because what happens nowadays is they have like drones or not drones but like they have like aerial satellite pictures of land and so then they they look at these pictures and are like hey you like shouldn't be doing this on your land here this is classified <laughs> as this kind of land you're not allowed to plant trees there you can't you, know, you can't have an alligator pond on your land, Joe. What are you doing? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah, and no I guess it comes from no a good problem. place because they they want to make sure people aren't just like destroying the countryside. But for people who like actually want to like help the environment and are really into ecology and and this sort of thing, it's really limiting because they they come up with these strict sort of like okay, this right. is land where you grow corn and this is land where you do this, and you're like okay. Well, what if I want to plant trees and uh, grow crops like in between those trees and have like a natural ecosystem that functions kind of like how ecosystems function? And it's just like so far out of their realm of mm -hmm. thinking that they're like, how do we track that with our Google Images satellite? It's like so. not my. That's really not my problem. Yeah. <laughs> I could I could take you some uh, snapshots with my phone and send it in. Right. <laughs> How about that? Then you could get the sideways view. <laughs> oh man, yeah, it's interesting. That's really interesting that you say like they're trying to err on the side of caution against damage, but they also don't want any progressiveness either. So they're like, in order to protect themselves, yeah, it's you know it's kind of like the immune the immune system of the body. Right. There could be like a really awesome substance that could help out the body. But if the immune system doesn't recognize it that way, it's going to kick it out the same way. And you're like, no, no, this is something I wanted. And the body's like, nope, nope, sorry. We're just, we're just being safe. We're just trying to make sure. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Bureaucrats. Yeah. It's the deal. That's the way rules are. They limit. And yeah. it's not just um, l limiting as intended. Uh, that when you draw a box, there are other limits that come with that as well, whether it's, um, it'd be the satellites that allow you to, uh, um, that they don't have a specific category to put you in, so you can't be uh, creative with the farm. Yeah. Um, so we can just see them, uh, it's about working with them skillfully. With anything, it's about working with it skillfully rather than resenting it. <laughs> Because that's so, the habit we've been trained into. I mean, at, the, at the end of the day, they, they really they don't have that much power though, because like nobody has ever. Well, there's been a couple people that have come out to my land, but not like like they're not ever going to. And there's so much land that like is just kind of like lost because basically what happens is people die and then they don't really know who inherited the land. And there's a lot of land in the world that just like 
nobody really knows who owns it and like somebody's kind of doing something with it but it's kind of like off the radar so kind of like the key like is to try to stay off the radar as much as possible and just fade into the background because you know you're just not you're not doing anything too wrong and 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 the main thing is, is like you just have good relationships with your neighbors because they're the ones that are going to turn you in for doing something wrong you know theoretically but as long as you have a good relationship with your neighbors like you know that's that's or just the how bureaucrat it when they come along invite them in serve them some right. delicious farm food make best friends yeah. with them <laughs> Yeah, I grew this right under my trees. <laughs> <laughs> so you really don't want, you really don't have a farm. You're trying to convert it into a park with crops. Is what you're. That's doing pretty now. much actually. Yeah. That, that that is pretty much it. Yeah. You're 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 like, listen, we need to reclassify what I have here. It's not a farm. It's a park <laughs> with crops on it. Okay, how about that? Do you have a little box for that? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, a lot of people have problems with this. I mean, like, uh, I, I was just watching somebody talk about uh, a wilding project that they had in the UK. And, like, wilding is taking, like, my ideas, but even more extreme to where you're, like, you're just doing nothing. So you take farmland <laughs> and you, you, do, you just do nothing and you put, like, you manage some animals a little bit uh, here and there. But otherwise, you cut off all inputs. You just don't do anything. You don't plant anything. Uh, and... The idea is if you if you have a farm that's losing money uh, and you just stop doing things, then you're not losing money anymore. So whatever you do has to be better than what you were doing before. And it's better for the environment because you're not growing crops and plowing the ground and doing all this stuff. But anyways, yeah, they don't really have a category for, for this. And <laughs> a lot of people who are doing this, they run into issues with, yeah, how to how to classify what exactly is going on even though that it's clearly like a huge ecological benefit. And if you talk to people, they're like, like, why wouldn't we want unproductive farmland to go back into wilderness? Like, that sounds like a great thing, you know? Um, but it just sort of like blows people's mind where they're like, but how does the farm make money? And you're like, but well, the farm hasn't made money for like, you know, year after year after year. It's, <laughs> it's, it's just, you know, you just stop yeah. not losing money. And then oh, all of a sudden in 20 years, you have a place that looks like a park and people want to go to. So this one place, it's kind of like a model in the UK. It's like a 1,200 hectare, 5,000 acre farm that was very unprofitable and they just stopped doing things. And now they run safaris there where they, and they make a lot more money running safaris and having people <laughs> drive around and look at the wild animals that have moved in there than they ever did growing crops. So... Yeah, I don't. I mean, there's all kinds of rooms for creativity and stuff like this. But um, and I think moving forward, I, I mean, you can feel that people who get into agriculture more and more, they have to come up with new ideas because everybody realizes the systems we have are like just extremely broken. Um, and yeah, there's there has to be a better way forward. But. You'd think that those bureaucratic forms would just have a big box that says N-A. I mean, every form I've ever seen has N-A. Yeah. You just, <laughs> just mark that. It's, yeah. It doesn't, it's not applicable. None of these categories yeah. are applicable. So it's just N-A, straight up N-A. Yeah. Or whatever the French equivalent to that is. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like this everywhere. I, you know, I think the only place it's not like this is in developing countries where it's it's still in, if you live in, I, I, there's a Thai farmer that I like and he's lived in America for a little while and he makes his YouTube videos kind of like he's Buddhist and a little philosophical about it. And the one thing he said is he's like, you know, in America, if you want to like extend your roof, like a foot, you got to like go through this massive process in Thailand. If you want to build a house, you just go up to your neighbor and you're like, Hey, can I like build a house over there? And they're like, sure. You know, like, I mean, it's just such a different, right. <laughs> Thing right, that's that's right. going on so where so where is freedom really you know like is it really free in america or these places yeah, that you know have a dictatorship a, and i think we know that that was and, that was something that's that's been sold to the american public for a long time now i think i think we know that that's that's there's a lot of there's a lot of um yeah it's it's a very tight definition of that yeah i think it's very obvious about freedom there yeah that um, this is sort of uh, bringing it back to the Dhamma, the idea of wrong view, ordinary right view, and super mundane right view, that uh, 
wrong view is no rules, complete anarchy, nothing. Everyone's thinking unwholesomely, a bunch of monkeys. The middle would be rights, rules, and rituals, people doing things, superstition, clinging to, clinging to um, if I follow these bureaucratic papers, uh, I'll be okay. And then the uh, super mundane is, <laughs> what's the problem with the world? problem with it, I can let it grow and be fine and eat off that. Uh, so, yes, uh, that is unwholesome. It's not liberating this uh, the ordinary view, but we can also <laughs> sort of be uh, grateful in a way that there are some sy- systems. It's yeah. not complete anarchy. Uh, somehow we're able to talk to each other that some bureaucracy is in place as dysfunctional as it may be that gets internet going and I can talk to you from Arizona to France. Yeah. Uh, so in a way we can be grateful because in complete <laughs> anarchy, imagine getting something like internet set up. Uh, uh, even in the, if everyone was noble thinking, people probably wouldn't care enough to get internet set up that everything's okay the way it is. Um, so looking at uh, that each has its pros and cons that uh, for someone who is noble and everyone else is uh, thinking ordinarily, Life can be made fairly easy with internet and ordering food and um, whatever it may be. Um, and uh, it's, you can't really speculate on uh, completely noble societies because there is really no example of that. Um, or if so, it's not very publicized. Uh, but Oh, they wouldn't be, even need to keep be, records. They wouldn't exactly. even need to keep records. Why would they even need a library? Exactly so. <laughs> what would be the point? <laughs> Just a bunch of happy folks. They wouldn't even need to name themselves. As Not whatever. at all. No. Or... no, no, no. That, uh, That's a good point, Parker. We've got... Being grateful that we have some systems. And, yeah. wow, I can go to a store that like we've talked about and I can yeah. pick up whatever food I want, uh, even though the way it's being gotten is probably fairly unwholesome. Go ahead, Rick. No, no, that's a good point. Like, you've got... You know, internet and delivery apps, but we've also got climate change. So, you know, go figure. <laughs> it's, it's all a balance, right? <laughs> Incredible convenience and also a lot of uh, consequences for that convenience. So, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's being able to, uh, this was like the eight worldly wins that we were talking about earlier in the conversation before you were here, Joe, uh, that the list is in front of me gain and loss, fame and disgrace praise and blame, pleasure and pain, that um, the ordinary person, the putajana, uh, will cling to either one of these or want it to be a different way. And there is the cycle of sam- samsara. I'm famous. Oh, yeah, I'm really enjoying fame. The fame is impermanent. It goes away. Oh, now I'm disgraceful. I don't really like that. I'm clinging to not being disgraceful. And there's the circle. So uh, in the same way, recognizing with worldly convi- conditions uh, that... Uh, this is sort of pleasure and pain, convenience and inconvenience, that yes, life will sometimes be inconvenient. Um, and recognizing it as that, um, that uh, there is inconvenience, but not wishing it would be different or liking or disliking it either way, uh, that just seeing it as something. And same with convenience. Wow, my life is really convenient. I'm very grateful for that. Just that. Instead of, uh, it's convenient right now and I really like this and my life. because. Um, it's impermanent. It might fade away. Yeah, yeah exactly. It might. It might. That we it's might go so into anarchy. Uh, it's not very likely with all the people that are clinging to all the rules and stuff that are in place. But if we are in anarchy, can you be ha- happy in anarchy? Can you find a safe way to live and satisfied to live way to live in anarchy? <laughs> in nuclear winter, can you be satisfied in nuclear winter? Yeah. <laughs> Can you enjoy you. the bomb as it goes off in the big show? <laughs> it's the flash I, of I a lifetime. Like I mean, really I, nice I think that would actually be, on it. That would be actually be a moment that would be very easy to, because you really would know your mortality, right? Because like one of the issues with why we struggle to enjoy is because we, we don't know our mortality. But when mm-hmm. you're on the brink of dying, like, you know, you, you kind of, you have to enjoy. I mean, that that's my reaction as a practitioner, at least. Like, I guess some people freak out and like cling to life. Depends but, on how, long, um, how strong the self-preservation instinct is, right? And if we can see yeah. it or not. Yeah, but I've, I mean, I've definitely had some moments. Like, I I was camping once, and I got uh, I got stuck on the other side of a river with no water and no food. But I mean, we had water from the river because it had. 
I, basically, I was stuck in a monsoon, and I had no cell phone, uh, no food, and I was kind of screwed and, like, slightly scared about dying because, like, trees are, like, falling down and <laughs> stuff, uh, you know, but it strangely felt, like, really calm for me. The other person I was with was freaking out a little bit, but <laughs> for me, I was just like, oh, man, like, you, you kind of, like, quickly, like, look back on everything and are like, wow, it all could just end right here, and, you know, this, <laughs> this, this is there's, it. <laughs> exactly, that there's no me that's ending, that we're not clinging to something and scared that it's going to go, that, uh, yeah. that the, all the fear comes from something we're clinging to and we're scared that by death or whatever coming, that it's going to end. And uh, that's the that's the ignorance. So if we can see that ignorance, that's why it's called deathless. That there is no me, I, me, or mine that is born. So there is no I, me, or mine to die. I'm grateful to have some good friends here and have the internet to connect us and yeah. <laughs> not to have a fear of death right now that everything's okay right now no <laughs> problems you guys are wonderful mm -hmm. all right gents well i've got to get going so it's good to see everybody for quite a while today actually <laughs> yeah. yeah but uh, anyway y'all have a great week a peaceful week satisfying week and I will catch you on the other side. Great. Good seeing you, Rick. Bye, right. guys. Bye. Hey. Yeah, I think I'll head out, too. That was a good note to end it on. So, yeah. Likewise. Enjoy. For anyone watching the video, feel free to check out the Discord. Check out these calls. Uh, everyone's welcome to join. It's just a Skype link. So, great. See you guys. Great seeing you, Joe. Yeah. Great seeing you, DJ. Yeah, yeah it was good seeing you, Parker and Joe. Bye. Bye. <laughs>